I know that we are very blessed in this shul, that we have with us survivors. And I know that it's not easy for them to talk, just the contrary, some of them prefer not to talk, and many of them haven't spoken. If you ask a survivor, you speak to many people, my parents haven't spoken for many, many years. But as the years go on, and as I received today an email with most horrific pictures, but I believe it was Eisenhower who said we should take these photographs because there will come a day that there will be people who will say that this did not happen. He understood that then when they liberated the camps. People have been denying the existence of the Holocaust for a good 20 plus years. What chutzpah? Wait until after 120 till the survivors aren't here anymore. But to deny it whilst they're still alive and with us, biz lange gesundte Yoren, amen, long healthy years to them, is the epitome of beyond chutzpah. So the only response we can have to these people and to their loved ones and to their family is being able to come to hear about the old life, the shtetl, the beauty of Yiddishkeit. Tonight isn't about mourning. Tonight isn't about just sadness. It's about to listen to the beauty of the blessings that was then. But to have with us Reb Nate, Reb Nachum, who's in show with us every week, and he shares with us such beautiful stories. And he's going to be afraid that he's going to cry a little bit. And say, it's okay to cry. It's okay. okay. If you don't cry, then there's something wrong with you. To share with us, not just about the people that he lost, which we want to hear too, but about what life was, what Yiddishkeit was back then, and how we here today, even, and especially in Short Hills, can perpetuate that. Uh, my name is Nochem. Everybody, I think, knows that. Uh, to tell you much about the old Haim, really, I, I can't, because I only had a few years that I remember before the war broke out. I remember it was a, uh, a uh, our town had 6,000 Jews. It was a population of 12,000. Half of them were Jewish, half were Gentile. And uh, everybody lived a, a Jewish life. And uh, to give you an example, I was once in a neighbor's garden and pulled out a carrot from, from the garden. And I, uh, we didn't have candy stores and ice cream parlors, so on. And uh, I scraped the carrot with the, with the goish and the, with the neighbor's knife. And then I realized that it's not a kosher knife. And I was running home and I was crying. And my mother asked me what happened. And I told her that I, I just scraped the carrot with a trefa knife, and uh, I'm eating the carrot, you know. This is just to give you an idea of what the life was like among the Eden. Uh, uh, many things I, do, I don't remember. I remember going with my father in shul, and uh, sitting near him in shul, but like I said, that was only about two years. Uh, then the war broke out. When the war broke out, uh, you want to know about the shtetl, or can I continue? What? The war broke out, and uh, I went to an aunt in a neighboring shtetl, and uh, two weeks later, the Germans came, and I could never return back. My father sent a, a railroad employee to pick me up, but my aunt wouldn't hear of it because the laws came out right away that Jews not to travel on the train, not to walk at sidewalks, and so on. And she said, I'm not going to let him go because they'll catch him and they'll shoot him. Little did she know that a few months ago she had perished. It was Simcha Sora when they had the first Schritte in, in the shtetl. The, the name of the shtetl was Kurenetz. <laughs> and from the, at that time, first they took my uncle, then they came and they took 
my aunt, when she saw what's happening, that they gather them on the marketplace in the center of the shtetl, and they gave them shovels. She realized what it was, and she shoved me under a couch, and that's how I survived. That was the first, the first uh, episode. Uh, I went to a not in the shtetl, the same in Kuranets was my mother's sister, that was my mother's sister. And uh, my father also had a sister with a very famous uh, tailor. And thanks to his being famous and a, a good craftsman, uh, thanks to him, I, I'm sitting here today and talking. So when the Schritte came, uh, they liquidated town after town in our area. They did not bother to send them to concentration camps, so they used to just surround, surround the town and uh, kill all the Jews. And uh, in each town, there was some craftsmen that they were really good specialists, uh, gifted people. And my uncle was one of them, and uh, they took the few gifted craftsmen from each town to the Gibitska Messiah in the, in the capital, like from the area, and uh, established a camp from, from all the craftsmen. And I came along with my uncle as, as a son of his. That was in 41, I was 10 years old. 10 or, or, or maybe 10 and a half. Dates, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure because I don't remember them, but I, some of them I estimate. And uh, we were there in that camp. Everybody was working. They established shops uh, to each uh, uh, profession, uh, not profession, uh, craft. And uh, young people have managed to make contact with partisans. And uh, the heating it for the big building was that with wood there. And constantly would come big uh, columns of wood supply for heating. There was a hospital there nearby for the hospital and the Gibitz Commissariat, the offices. And they managed the young uh, however, when I say young, uh, I was a kid then, but they were probably less than 20, but heroic guys. First of all, I can say that I saw them carrying bottles of acid, and when uh, the discussion was when the Schritte would come, it was not a question, will it come, but we knew it would come. The last minute, they were prepared to pour them in the eyes of the murderers. Shkita meaning the slaughter. Yes. The liquidation. We called it shkita. And uh, I also overheard them, if somebody is fortunate to survive, and always a few survive by, by hook or by crook, as they say, to go to the Kaltedorf, in Yiddish, the Kaltedorf, in Russian, it was called Studionka, which it means the cold village. And there is a person of so or so, Mikolai, and he will give you an idea of how to go deep into the woods. I overheard that, and it, and it came to very useful to me. One day, they uh, managed, you know, in a sled, it was in the winter time, there's a few boards in the sled, and then they load the wood on top of it. And uh, one day they were put in a gouged out board with a rifle and a few other uh, bullets or whatever it was, not, not a big thing. And uh, as the, the man was pulling out, he unloaded, he unloaded the uh, wood and uh, assessment held him up and uh, took him away. Like fire spreading, it said me hot gimasat, they squealed, and everybody started running. That was in the middle of the day. 
I, I don't like to say that, you know, but I shouldn't think that I make myself a hero or so, but I, before I run out, I run upstairs to my uncle, and I, he was on the second floor in the Schneiderei, and I told him that uh, everybody is running out, and he says, I'm not going to run. He says, you run. I was among the last ones that I ran out from, from the ghetto. And we ran across, the, the town was Vileken, it was a good sized town, and we ran through the center and nobody paid attention. A few hundred people ran out and we reached the woods, ran across towards the woods. And when we came in the woods, uh, we regrouped and instead of going deeper in the woods, we made like a U-turn and came out of the woods. And by that time, they were chasing us. They realized that the ghetto broke out. And they opened fire, and uh, most of the people got killed right there by returning back towards the wood. And uh, I was one of a few that didn't get hit. People were falling left and right like flies. And but it's, it got dark by that time. I also will not uh, throw this out from the story, but it's hard to believe that a dog was no more than about six, seven feet from me. And he was walking around and sniffing. And I was leaning against a tree. And then I heard his mice, uh, master uh, call him in German. And it got dark, and uh, he went away. Now, that, that was my luck, and uh, through the years, I told a few times to pe medical people, and they say that a dog will not go to a dead person. I must have been so scared that my heart practically stopped beating, and uh, he thought that I was dead. But then four more boys showed up, you know, I, we had, I heard, we heard that uh, they were calling everybody and they left. And it was midnight by then. And two ladies, one was carrying a child on their hands. And uh, I knew that we have to go to Studionka, the Kaltedorf. I overheard it while I was working with, with men in the ghetto. If you survived to go to the Kaltedorf. And uh, I, uh, since I was the only blonde guy, so the two women decided that I should go in and uh, ask how to get to Studionka. And uh, also ask for some, something to eat. And we ran away from each road path. We, didn't, we went across uh, the woods and uh, I asked them which side the sun should be on my right side or the left side to go to Studionka. And the sun gets up and the sun sets down. And every day when I walked in in a village and I asked how far are we from Velekia or Kurvenets, either one of these two towns, there was always the same distance, either two kilometers or one and a half kilometer. We walked in a circle. Uh, I'll try to make it fast. When we uh, were ready to give up. I always thought it was three weeks, but I realized I don't really know how long it was. But I know that my, I was wearing boots and they had to cut open. and my feet got swollen. They couldn't pull the boots off. And there was a, a single house, they call it a chuta there. There's villages and there are single houses. And we decided to go in and ask him to if we can go in and sleep over there. They used to have a board, a bed house, built far away from the house because they were very primitive. There was a pile of stones. They used to heat the stones up, throw water on the stones and create steam. They get one stone in a barrel of water, make hot water and so on. So those bed houses used to catch fire, so they built them far enough they shouldn't burn down the whole house. And they also stayed warm for a whole week. They, they bathed once a week there. And uh, we went in and uh, the owner came and brought us uh, 
a barrel of a wooden pail like uh, with potatoes that he cooked for the pigs. It was little potatoes and we devoured them in a second. And it was nice and warm there and he cut off my, uh, the split the boot and took my boots off. It was a very cold night and over there when it's cold it's, it's dry and we hear the dogs barking and uh, horses galloping in. And uh, the, the kids were younger than me and the two women went crazy. They started pulling the, the hair from the, and they said, that uns verkauft. He sold us out. And uh, <clears throat> then we hear people coming towards the birdhouse. As I explained, it's not by the house. And you hear the steps, you know, and talking loud. Uh, all my life, I wonder why we didn't open the door and start running. But I, I know the answer. We were. We were ready to give up to begin with. That's why we went in to ask him to stay over there. And as the door opened up, it was partisans that came to rob from this farm because it was in enemy territory. They were allowed only to get provisions in enemy territory. And uh, the first guy that walked in was from Kuenitz and a friend of my cousin that was already killed then. And he was heavily armed. He recognized me and started hugging me. And, and uh, he also hugged and kissed the owner because when they came to request provisions, he says, I have Jews in the bad house. So he says, let's go and see who they are. And there he walked in and he told them the truth. He said, Nobody from our group will ever come to you uh, demanding or robbing, you can call it either way. And uh, he took us into, he borrowed from him a sled with a uh, with horse, which he returned then, and he put us on that and took us in into the push, the pushes deep into the woods. This is more or less the story, my last escape from the German hands in, into the woods. It goes on and on and on and on, you know, but uh, I don't want to bore you with... <laughs> Couple of questions. How long did you live in the woods? Though? In the woods we lived uh, almost two years. How did you eat? How did you survive? Well, one of the first, he took us into to the Pusche, because Pusche is a, a large woods. And that area was already overrun by the Germans. They knew about it, but there was uh, empty uh, bunkers, like Simlanki, they call them in Russian. And he led us into those uh, thing. I was there maybe for a week, and uh, one of the boys that came with me uh, had a father in the woods, and the father came to pick up his son. He heard that his son is alive, and he came, and he said to me, "You brought my son. You come with me too." A uh, few days later, whoever was there, they, they all got killed. The Germans showed up again and they were in that place many times. And they, and they caught a lot of Jewish people, remnants. And so uh, by, by having a kid come with me and his father being so happy that he said to me, come with me, and we went to a different place. We used to go out begging at night, knock in, knock in the window and say, please give something to eat. And it was very dangerous thing to do because when you, in the woods, I felt like I was in the safest place on earth. I, I felt so good escaping from the ghetto and being in the woods. But when you go into a village, you know, the villages have agricultural fields around. So the woods are, in some cases, maybe two kilometers. And when you go, just to go there, 
the heart used to fall out. <laughs> and I'm living proof that bad times does not necessarily, there's a doctor sitting in the front of me, does not necessarily shorten life or whatever. I am living proof to that. Do you have any family members with you? A long time later, I found my father. And that was a coincidence to, uh, if, if you want me to, I can uh, tell what happened there. That person that took me away with his kid was accepted in a partisan group, and he took me in also. He, he was nice to me, and uh, I was a shepherd there for a very short time. The partisans were then organizing. There was very few weapons, and they would only accept people that had a weapon, or uh, they would tell them, go and get a weapon. And many times they would come with a weapon and take away the weapons and not accept them anyway. This is a, another story altogether. While I was with the group, uh, the, the, com the company, or the Atrad, as they call it in Russian, which it is probably the same, was called Mestitel. Mestitel is Nikome. Revenge. Nikome. Not prevention. Revenge. Revenge. Come on. Come on. Revenge. Revenge. Yeah. Anyway, and I did not go to college, so I'm not so good in in, in English. And uh, we were uh, one time we were. If you guys saw the movie uh, uh, from the Belskis, they show. They find, they show an episode where they were surrounded, and th those kinds of surroundings happen uh, quite often, a few times a year. So our area was surrounded by Germans, and uh, it was coming up a big blockade, that we used to call it, like a sweep, uh, whatever. And uh, they uh, had a formation in the middle of the night, and they put all the uh, armed people on one side and the unarmed people on the other side. And they said, we will be in touch with you. And uh, we will, the armed people will go and try to break through the surrounding, you know. Of course, that n never happened. And they didn't have even, the armed people didn't have the weapons to break through the, uh, the German army. But uh, as this was happening, I recognized a guy that lived in Dayton, Ohio, till two years ago. And he was my angel. And uh, his name was Hirschke, Hirschke Gordon. And uh, I was a shy kid, you know, most kids probably are shy. So first I followed him. And then I braved and I went over and I said, Dubinst Hirschke? In, in Yiddish. And he says, he took a look at me. I was in regs then. And, and he said, The way Snochem Kezokta, dein Tate left, your father is alive. And he is on Nivier. Nivier was a different area with big swamps that it was hard even then as a kid to walk on that. You almost drowned. And uh, a few Jews were hiding there. And uh, the group, unarmed people, start splitting up in small groups to survive simply because it's easier to survive as a small group. And there was two brothers from Kurenitz that knew my family and said to me, nobody wanted the kid, by the way. It's not nice to say, but they didn't want the kid around. And they said, uh, you can go with us. But when I heard that my father is on Nivea, I overheard another group that they're going to Nivea. So I said, I'm going to st stick with them and I'll reach where my father is. <sighs> to make a long story short, those two people were caught and they had a very I don't want to say the kids are here, uh, very bad death. 
had I gone with them. And uh, the people that went to Nivier and uh, didn't want me, they couldn't chase me away. At times I was walking uh, half a kilometer or whatever behind them. And uh, they didn't want me, they threatened me, but they couldn't chase me away. They didn't want you because you're a burden, because you're a kid? They didn't want me. And when they couldn't chase me away, they also, we had to cross villages, so they, they uh, used me, uh, you know, you look like a Gentile, go in and see if, uh, the, if the village is passable, because there was always either Germans or police there. So I went into many of them, and one time I walked in a village and there was Germans there, and I was running back, and the woods were not around the corner, like I described before. And uh, they saw me running back, and I lost them. A lot of things happened. But we finally came to Nivea, and that is where I found my father. And your mother? And my mother died shortly before the War of Natural Code. And any other siblings, any other family? My, I had a little sister, and she perished. My father, I have to say, built a bunker in the ghetto. We were separate. I was not with him in Glubok. And as I said, I got stuck in a little town. I could never come back. He built a bunker that 30 people survived. And, and that, that I, it's hard to understand what that means, but to build in secrecy with no Home Depot buying material, and, and uh, getting rid of the dirt and, and getting material, that was, I, I think he was a hero. That's why I'm telling this story. And they, the house burned down and they survived. And when they crossed the main road that goes to Vilna, we were not far from Vilna, uh, there was an ambush there because the ghetto was liquidated and they knew that bunkers like that existed in the ghetto. So they were sitting and waiting for, and in order to reach the woods, they had to cross that main road. And uh, that's why I went a few times to that area. I was living with hope that my sister, that I'll find her life with the family, with children, with Goyim, you know, with the home, because there was no Jews there. But my father told me that she ran into wheat, when you harvest the wheat, you stand them up in, in, uh, and to ripen like. And my sister was then five years old. So she ran into the, to the wheat. It's like a contained little uh, pile of, uh, and uh, he told me that and I lived with this dream and she was a beautiful little girl, also blonde. And I uh, had this belief that uh, somebody rescued her. And I'll find her during the Soviet Union, we couldn't go there. After the collapse of the Soviet Union was 50 years later, and I was one of the first that went there and I made an announcement in the local, pa the biggest publication paper in Minsk. And, uh, I was on TV there, I was telling the story. Anyway, people even told me that I'll get blackmailed. Uh, they'll tell me stories and look for money, but nothing happened. On the contrary, what happened is that I found, I found a man. First of all, the whole village where the wheat was there knew that a girl was pulled out from there and shot. I don't know if it's my sister, it could have been somebody else too. They did say that she was older than what I thought, but I didn't see her in two years then. And we were all tall people in our family. And uh, I even found the person, first he disappeared in, in the village. I walked in his house and there was a pot being cooked on the stove. and. Uh, but I waited and I found him and he admitted that he buried the little girl. 
So we went looking for that. I have pictures and uh, we dug up the whole area. We didn't find any size, any, anything of that. Only two siblings in the family? Yeah. And if we're just, I'm going to go to Harry just and then we'll open up to people. When did your father and you come over here? What year? In 50, 1950. And we were liberated. We came uh, back home. Back home was being among uh, the same uh, enemies, the same people that helped destroying our people. So the first opportunity we had to leave as former Polish uh, citizens. My father uh, remarried then and uh, I was young and not very smart and I was not very happy with it. So we left our home and uh, our hometown. We came to Poland. Poland was a, was a satellite of Russia, was the same thing. But in Poland, there was already kibbutzim and everything. I walked in in a place where there was singing and dancing and there was bread with marmalade, you know, and I, I could always eat good. <laughs> and I discovered America. And then uh, we were continuing to illegal from Poland to the American zone in uh, Germany. There we were in uh, the camp for five years until we came. Yeah. Five years? Yeah.